go ahead. Okay. Well, I am uh, for Amtgard, I am Dame Calandra Drakowolf, and I'm from the County of Ravens Cross in the Kingdom of Golden Plains, in the Panhandle, Texas here. Uh, for SEA, I am Lady Serena Calandra in Char Adler's Rue Ru Adler's Ru in the Kingdom of Onsiora. And I have been weaving since I was a kid, doing various things, starting with potholder looms and paper placemats and such. And I started doing some little mini tapestry weaving things uh, for wall hangings and door hangings when I was in high school. And when I, which has been almost 20 years now, I started getting into finger weaving, which is the actual technical term for the te style weaving that's done with macrame cord and parachute cord that you see at a lot of amped card events, uh, those type of belts. And I then later got into card weaving a little bit and then ingle weaving. And I've done a little tiny bit of rigid huddle weaving. And I'm going to explain what all those things mean here in just a moment. Because that's a lot of words to say there is a lot of different types of weaving and it can be a little intimidating when you're looking into starting to get into things and you start looking at looms and you see all these things that you don't know what they are. So I'm going to start with some basic terms that will help uh, when I'm talking about weaving. So your warp threads are the threads that go around your loom. Which I will show that here with my tiny little ink loom. So these threads that are going around, that's my warp. The weft is this that I'm weaving with. And the shuttle is what it's attached to right now. You don't always need a shuttle, but with most weaving, a shuttle is usually used. Tapestry is kind of an exception to that. When we talk about weaving, there's a thing called a shed. The shed is what your shuttle passes through. So on an ankle loom, which is what this is when these come in a lot of different sizes. The shed is created by raising or pushing down and lowering. And the shed is what your shuttle passes through like this. So in your basic ankle weaving generally you have two sheds you have up and down. There are some ways to create some others. We'll get into that in a little bit here. But another thing to know with weaving is you often hear about of three different styles that are, are terms that you'll commonly see. Warp faced, weft faced, and plain weave or even or well even weave. So a warp faced weaving or pattern is where your warp threads set your pattern. Most of your ankle bands are commonly the ankle bands that you find on the ankle loom are going to be warp faced. So is tablet weaving, which I'm going to show here as my shuttle falls over. Tablet weaving is another warp faced band. Tablet weaving is something that you do with cards. Turning them creates different patterns. Weft faced weaves are commonly what you see for tapestry weaving. And I'm going to show some pictures of some different things. And then when I mention even weave, if you do any sort of needlework, you may see even weave fabric is something that's called for with embroidery. Even weave means uh, that you see both the warp and the weft, you see them evenly spaced. On a warp face band or warp face piece, you're not supposed to see the weft at all. On a weft face we, uh, weaving, which is what tapestry is, your weft that you're weaving with creates your patterns and you usually don't see your warp threads unless you're doing a specialty design where it shows through. Let me bring up some pictures here. And then you have some fun ones like finger weaving, as I mentioned with the belts, that is technically, it is a warp faced weave, but it, your weft and your warp are the same thing. So I will demonstrate some with that here in a little bit. 
So if you've been around an amped guard at all, then you're familiar with this type of weaving or at least seeing these belts out because you cannot go to an amped guard event without seeing a belt made from macrame cord or parachute cord. Uh, I'm old enough that parachute cord predates when I was weaving a lot of belts. I used to sell these for, I wove them for about 10 years or so. And there's a variety of different patterns that you can create with these. These are all sold a long, long time ago. And there's different other different things that you can do. And that is actually a crocheted belt. So that's showing some finger weaving. Now finger weaving actually is actually a medieval medieval weaving form. We don't hear about it often a lot of the history of it, but there is evidence that uh, it was used woven with silk and fine threads used in the Ottoman Empire. And it was used to make little ties on some of the some of the clothing and other decorative trim. Now, some if with finger loop braiding, which is done with loops on your fingers, they create similar patterns to the finger weaving patterns because it can be done in flat and recreate some of the exact same designs. This one is a lightning bolt weave that is from the book uh, Finger Weaving. Or sorry, I believe I'll still get the right title. I believe it's in. Finger weaving, Indian braiding, or Indian braiding, Indian braiding wing, finger weaving. It's by Alta R. Turner. That's the best thing to search is by her name to find it. And this is done with cotton yarn. Native. This is based off of uh, Native American patterns. And you will commonly find if you search for Native American sashes, you will find finger woven sashes that are beautiful works of art woven with wool. Uh, but some people want to say that it's completely a Native American art form, but it is not. Uh, it, finger weaving can be found in several cultures throughout the world at different time periods, uh, predating before coming before before uh, Europeans came to America here. So there's a lot of different possibilities of what you can do with with finger weaving. But the book by Alter R. Turner is a good starting point if you're wanting to wanting to start to get into finger weaving. So I'm trying to get back to another. So I'm going to go through some different things on different forms here in just a moment, but I'm trying to get to some other examples to show you. So you get to see all my pictures here in the meantime, and that's okay. So I'm talking about ankle weaving. Now this is also technically a, a, an ancient form of weaving. The loom itself that we use, which comes in a variety of different sizes and shapes. Here are two of mine here. The loom itself was made, made around the 1970s is when that came about for this style of loom. Prior to that time period, narrow bands such as this would have been woven in a variety of different methods. One commonly used method would be a backstrap loom, which is where you have the piece you're weaving anchored to you, usually with a belt, and then anchored to another fixed object, uh, such as a tree post or anything that's not going to move. Tablet weaving is also done that way, can be done that way too, and tapestry weaving. Uh, that for, and some examples of backstrap weaving to look up would be to search for Guatemalan weaving, Andean weaving, and anything South American weaving in general. Uh, you will still see commonly that backstrap weaving is still done today, and there's a lot of variety in complex patterns that you can create and can make a variety of different styles using a backstrap. Also, some other methods that would be used would involve using a rigid heddle, which I'm going to show in a few minutes here. 
Just wanted to show some different examples. This is an example of a simple ankle weaving band. This is called plain weave, where, as I said, the warp creates the pattern. And there's a variety of patterns that you can create with that. You can also do some more advanced types of pickup weaving, which is what this is. See here how it starts at the bottom is kind of being a plane. So these purple threads are the pattern threads. And you, with each pass of the shuttle, you can raise threads from the bottom or lower threads from the top to create different patterns. And this style particularly is Baltic pickup weaving. A good book for that is The Weaver's Inkle Pattern Directory by Ann Dixon. And that has goes over a variety of different styles of inkle weaving patterns. And it's fairly easy read to start off with. And this is more pickup weaving, showing how complex you can get with your patterns. This is actually my, my favorite one. These, uh, all that I've shown so far for the pickup patterns are in that book that I just mentioned, the Inkle Weaver's Pattern Directory, or the Weaver's Inkle Pattern Directory. I may have that mixed around, but it is by Ann Dixon. So that's some Inkle Weaving. And I have a little bit of tapestry to show you some examples. As I mentioned, tapestry weaving is a weft waist weave. So the threads you're weaving with are creating your patterns. This is Technically, it's a it's a tapestry because I'm creating designs into into my fabric or weaving designs into it. Now, you can also be complicated and weave shapes and figures and things like that. But this is just doing some simple pattern work. It looks a lot like the patterns I show with the inkle weaving, only this is done by the weft creating the pattern instead of the warp. And this was just a simple pouch that I wove on a cardboard loom. So I'll, show, I'll show one of those here in a moment. Na the Navajo we rug weaving, oh, that's not the picture I want to go to. That was my bad attempt at some garb at one point. Navajo weaving, if you look at the Navajo rugs, that is actually a form of tapestry weaving. And it is, a, it is weft based. This is a small little sample tapestry trying to show some different techniques in here. Uh, but for Amtgard SCA purposes, you could weave small little banners or pouches. Uh, easy enough to try to weave a little bit of heraldry if you have something simple. Definitely not with my complex heraldry, but you know, some people have some simple heraldry that you could weave. No, I, I disagree 1000%. <laughs> no one has simple heraldry ever. <laughs> I have a simplified version of my heraldry that is just a moon. That one could be <laughs> my husband. My husband has the simplest heraldry. It's a triangle. But, you know, he's a barbarian, so he had to be easy and to do things. Well, that, actually, that would be his household's heraldry. So, yeah, I don't know. But there are some simple ones out there. So I'm talking about all these different things. So let's go over some different looms. So I did show an equal loom. This is my small one. This one is actually a Windhaven fiber, fiber tools loom. I do highly recommend them. I actually own two. I had another one, but I gave away to gave it away to somebody uh, on things because they really wanted to get into weaving. But they come in a variety of sizes. And this is one size. I also have I, my large ankle loom will weave nine feet. There are some you can get that will actually weave like nine yards. And those are big floor looms that I wish I had the ability to work, but I would not. 
do that. I also have my workhorse loom is a Becca brand, B-E-K-A, I believe. And that one, I really, I really like using that one. But I was mentioning how you can do the ankle weaving without a loom. Because ankle just means narrow band. So technically tablet woven bands are ankle bands too. And if you look at some of the groups on Facebook, you will see that they will post both tablet weaving and uh, what we generally refer to ankle weaving bands on the same thing. And that's okay. But I was mentioning a rigid heddle. Now, this is one type of rigid heddle versus on the ankle loom that uses String heddles. Heddles are what separate your threads to help form your sheds. And a rigid heddle can be used for a simple band. This one is set up to be used for backstrap weaving, where I would take the, the style rod and I would tie this to a belt to me, because it's always best to have some sort of rigid object like a dowel rod to attach your yarn to. And then I would tie the other end to another fixed post. And I'm going to roughly demonstrate here that this slides up and down to create the different sheds. And you can actually get really fancy and get pattern heddles. This one was made by Alona with her laser. But these type of the wooden pattern heddles are actually very old. Uh, if you look at Scandinavian weaving, uh, especially look at Sami bands or uh, Latvia and also Estonia. And you will find a lot of bands that are actually woven with complex pattern heddles. Uh, some of them are generally smaller than this, but you'll all see some large ones as well. And this has the big slots and then the, and the holes. So your pattern threads go through the slot, the bigger slots. And then you have your regular background threads going going through the holes and so that you can do different types of pickup weaving with that. Now, commonly though, what people think about when they hear this term rigid heddle is gonna be a larger loom that big things of cloth are woven on. This is a more modern regular rigid heddle. I don't have a regular rigid heddle loom anymore the one I had was too big for me, so I got rid of that, but I do have one that can be used. Because you can get outside of the box here and be creative with your weaving. This is a, another ankle loom. This is a Windhaven accordion loom. And this one actually can be changed the sizes. I have 12 inch rods that I can put in here. Right now, these are the six inch. And with the 12 inch in, this can actually be used as a rigid hello loom, or it can also be used upright as a tapestry loom, and it can be an ankle loom. I also have separators where it can be used as a bead loom. So a lot of diversity. Uh, bead looms you can also use as small tapestry loom too, if you wanted to, as they have the separations on it. This is my one example of weaving something on a rigid hello loom. This one is kind of a not quite even weave. So it's kind of a combination of a warp and weft because a plaid type fabric, which is what I was kind of going for in here, is a combination of that because you do you do tend to see both your you have you have to set some of your colored threads or different threads in a pattern in your warp, but then also you have to weave in stripes too. So that one is both warp and weft when you look at plaids. And I do have a picture to show of my rigid heddle loom that I used to have. I'm gonna try to here. Okay, let's get that brought out. There we go. So this is a, a large rigid, rigid head loom. This one was 25 inches. You can get them in a variety of sizes. Uh, eight inch, I think, is the smallest that I've seen. And the way this works is you have your heddle here. 
when it's in the resting position on most looms, it's going to be resting on blocks. There are some that don't have blocks, but a block allows you to set it up in a resting position or to raise it up and you take it off the block and push it down to lower it. So it's similar to the, the motions with the ankle loom with raising and lowering. It's just that you have this hard rigid heddle to be able to do that. With this type of loom, you can do a variety of different types of weaving because you can set it to weave small bands and make them warp faced. You can do weft waist weaves with it if you have a large one, large enough area. You can also do even weaves and plaids and different things like that. And you can do a variety of different patterns. You can also, with a lot of them, you can buy a second heddle to put behind it and be able to have more sheds so that you can do more complicated patterns. The big thing that helps make the difference between whether your, your warp's gonna show or not is the set of your threads. Because you can set this to where there's space like I have on here, or you can push them close together and be tight. And that's where you'll end up with your warp face look where your warp, your weft is not gonna show. And there are a lot of variety of books and resources out there. I don't really have one to recommend on this one because I didn't get very far with it. Uh, but if you're wanting to try a lot of different things, uh, this is something that to look into. Now, there are a lot of other types of looms that are out there. Uh, you'll see things such as floor looms or uh, things that will say they're four shaft or eight shaft. And those are a little bit uh, more complex. And I, I don't really have any experience working with those because I know that I would never get around to actually being able to complete warping one. Uh, but they're pretty to look at. And I know a lot of people can make, uh, do like weaving of those and you can create some very beautiful things with that. Uh, but you can do complex things with the looms that I've showed you as well. Uh, everything that I've shown so far tends to be a little bit on a lower price point on the getting into the entry level. Now, rigid heddle loom, the one that I showed, I got on eBay for $100. It is from the 70s. It is called an Erica loom. If you can find one of those, they are generally still in pretty good shape and for mostly fairly well made. A brand new one of that size of a 25 inch is probably going to run you like over $300, but you can get some eight inch and 10 inch ones and in the more $150 range, 150 to 200, somewhere in there. Uh, but eBay is a good resource for looking at uh, rigid heddle looms to try to test things out. Uh, an ankle loom, those are generally going to run you somewhere and you can find a lot of them in the $40 to $100 range. You also can make one easily. Uh, when I showed earlier with my Becca, the large one, that was just a simple, it was one large uh, piece of wood and then two upright pieces and the dowel rods going into the upright pieces. The difficult thing is making sure you have a tensioning device. Uh, that one you may have to ask somebody that's a woodworking friend if you're not a woodworker. On here, I have, see, I have this little knob right here and this, where this slides. This is the tensioning rod uh, or tensioning rod. And that moves forward and backwards to be able to change your tension. For an ankle loom, you need to, you have to have that because otherwise you're not going to be able to move your piece around the loom because this is one big circle that's tied together. And so loosening this is what allows me to move this or advance the warp, which is what I'm doing here. And I'm going to move that back a little bit because I wasn't quite ready for that. So then you just push it forward and tighten things back up. So that's important to have that tensioning device. On a tapestry loom, you will need to have some form of tensioning. Sometimes you can do that with just how you warp it and the string, but some people will put in, use screws to create tensioning on that too. I'm going to show my tapestry loom. Well, this is also my spring loom. Spring is a sometimes referred to as weaving and it's a it's a Scandinavian generally was found in less Scandinavian countries and other places throughout the world. Egyptians used it too. And if you look at a hammock, that's the type of mesh hammock. 
those are made with spring and that is made by manipulating the threads around each other to just kind of twisted so your warp and weft are all the same but this is what i use for a spring loom but it can also be used as a tapestry loom and this is just a simple a frame it is tied at the bottom to make things up make things easier here but i have this rod attached to this by just some pieces of yarn uh, or twine and that is creating some tension this is similar to a setup that you would see with navajo weaving where they have the tent use that tensioning in the and the rods like this you can get lo larger looms that have pegs on them those are when you look at those those are often what are used for tapestry weaving or rug weaving a rug weaving often is going to be a weft faced thing that you do and that can be as simple as just weaving over under over under and repeating or doing something like i showed with the blue and white uh, purse with creating different patterns and one of the one of the the links that i shared has a link to how to create patterns for simple ankle weaving some of the pattern theory that's discussed in there also works with tapestry weaving but in the, i also have a tapestry weaving handout that i included that has more detail breaking down tapestry weaving and different ways to do it uh, to do that uh, with that that's also a class that i teach a lot so if you're interested in that let me know and i actually can share some videos from that we do have some of that now i mentioned with finger weaving i was going to try to demonstrate a little bit how that works i don't know how well this one will be seen So I have this one I had set up as a chevron, but I'm not going to demonstrate the chevron at the moment with that. This is how I keep my pieces when I'm in the middle of working is I just try a loose knot on each side. But when you have your, your piece like this, usually I would have it anchored to a fixed point, such as a toe is a common thing that people use. Or I, I like C clamps. Those, those are great if you don't feel like putting your toe up on your foot up on something, is you can bring a C clamp and attach your weaving to that. And that's something the back instead of doing a back strap loom, you can do that too with the tablet weaving or the tapest or not tapestry, the ankle weaving, is you can put it between C clamps. But in your finger weaving, as I said, your warp and weft are the same thing. And so you start on the outside and then you would weave to the other side. This one would be a little hard to, I'm trying to make sure where are my, which ones are which. So it's just a simple thing of you're going over and under all the way across. And so now I have the, this thread I was weaving with is over here. So then my next one, I'm going to start from the same side again and alternate my over and under going across. And then this one that I wove from the previous row, I'm going to incorporate that in. And so that's how you have both your warp and weft being part of what you're weaving with. So this one we're just meaning to, I'm just trying to go over an overview of some different types of weaving and showing different examples. Uh, if you want more in-depth instruction, please let me know. For most of these things, I can go over that with you. So going back to what I was showing with card weaving. Now, this is not my favorite at all, but it does create some very beautiful and complex patterns. And I know some people absolutely love card weaving. And this create can create a fairly thick band. 
uh, depending on what you're using. So using the yarn here. So you have the pa this pattern on one side and then it looks like this on the other side. With a lot of the tab or the tablet weaving or card weaving patterns, they are going to look different on the different sides, which can be fun. And the way this works is you have a card that has four holes. And when you're weaving with it, you turn the cards to create your different sheds. And a lot of patterns are set up where all the cards are going to turn the same, oftentimes a series of four forward, four backwards, uh, because that helps uh, undo the twist that will build up on it and make it really difficult to move anything. But you can also find some really complex ones where we'll have where you have two cards turning one direction and then a card turning another and then four turning turning backwards and then two forward and things like that. And it can create some some very intricate designs and patterns. Uh, one thing if you're starting to look into tablet weaving patterns and also pick up weaving patterns for ankle bands. You do need to be aware of to watch out for swastikas that will show up in the patterns. Um, because a lot of the historical patterns do have them in there. And some countries such as in Estonia uh, still use them commonly today in some of their folkware. And that's generally not a symbol that we, that are not absolutely a symbol we do not want to see at Amsterdam or SEA or any of, any of those events and things. So when you're looking at the patterns, look at it carefully and make sure that it does not have a swastika in it. Because uh, a lot of them, when you go through Pinterest, you're going to see a lot of them come up that way. You also have to be careful when you're turning your tablets that with some things of how they work, while you may not have that in your pattern, if you mess up your turns, you may accidentally create one. So just be wary of that. Uh, you, know, you can usually, if you look at those patterns that have them, you can usually tell which patterns may create an accidental one and avoid those. You know, something like this you're not going to get that. So you're good with the diamonds and things like that. Uh, and I know the popular dragon's head, things like that are uh, easy or fun ones to do. I say you can create dragons. You can get very complex with the tablet weaving as well. And you can create brocade uh, with that. And you can have ones uh, double faced and have where you have intricate designs on one side and a different one on the other. You can weave animals into things. And so there are a lot of options you can do where all you really need is cards, which you can uh, buy in a variety of places, or you can also just make them. I have a set I made with a deck of cards and just have to make sure to line up your holes to be even when you're punching them. Uh, some people will also make them out of wood or leather. Uh, Bone was also something you might see or horn or things like that, but a simple cardboard is easy enough or a heavy, a heavy cardstock. You don't want cardstock can be a little bit thin. So you want something that's going to hold up a little bit. So just kind of look around at that. But usually you can get a set of cards for five to $10 in different places and you want to make sure you have at least 25 if you're going to be weaving with yarn if you're going to weave with anything thinner i would recommend having 50 to 100 because uh, also they try to run away but weaving with uh, weaving with crochet cotton things tend to be a little bit thin and i had a sample of oh it fell on the floor that's why i couldn't find it Okay, this is a sample of something that's badly woven and very uneven, but this is done with number 10 crochet cotton. And it's not a very wide band, but it uses a lot of thread and a lot of cards. And part of also how the patterns are formed with card weaving is how the cards are warped. Uh, there's a direction with yarn, uh, S twist and Z twist. And so sometimes they will be threaded from the back of the card to the front and sometimes the front to the back. And that depending on which twist that it's needing to have for that particular hole. And so that will help create your patterns as well. Just some simple things with that. And if you're getting into uh, narrow bands, number 10 crochet cotton is very good. Number five crochet cotton is also uh, fun to weave with but not always as sturdy, but that's what 
uh, the green part on this is number five. Mm. Trying to look, so I can usually tell. It looks like mostly I have number tens around here. But you can also, with pickup weaving in different styles, you can create letters. And it's very easy to weave letters into things. You can also do that with tablet weaving. And so with both of those, you don't even need to have a loom. With uh, plain ingle weaving bands, if you wanted to weave without a loom, you can do that with a backstrap setting. You don't have to have a rigid heddle either, but you can buy those for about $10 to $15 for a small little one. But you can just take a dowel rod and put string heddles on it. When I mentioned before about South American weaving, and you, if you look, search for that, especially with the Andean weaving, you will see uh, women usually sitting on the ground with their uh, with their weaving attached to their back, and they have several dowel rods that will have string heddles on them that they're using to create patterns. And they often will use a variety of different styles of the weaving in one piece because they may use a technique called pebble weaving to create one section of a band, and they may use a little bit of a pick, another type of pickup weaving in another section, and then have some areas of plain weaving all in the same piece. So you can set things up in a variety of different ways and get started without having a whole lot in there. Uh, also, if you do are interested in tapestry weaving, I do also recommend uh, looking into Andean weaving. That's kind of been my, my focus lately. I like this book. Textiles from the Andes by Penelope Dransart and Helen Wolf. That has some beautiful examples of weaving, as well as the Peruvian Four Selvage Cloth Ancient Threads New Directions. So if you're interested in any sort of history with weaving, uh, these are two good resources. Getting started with tablet weaving or card weaving. I like card weaving by Candace Crockett uh, is one that's easy to find. There are several books by Peter Collingwood that are also recommended, but those tend to be out of print and can be very pricey uh, to track down. My finger weaving book ran away from me, so I don't have that one to show. Also, just in general, uh, for fiber artists, 5,000 Years of Textiles also has a lot of good things about different styles of weaving and a lot of examples available. Uh, this is edited by Jennifer Harris. So some different samples of books. I mentioned cardboard weaving. So you can buy cardboard looms, which I did because I was teaching a bunch of classes, or you can make one easily. Now this one has notches at both the top and bottom, but you can also just Put notches on one side and warp all the way around it and weave on the front and the back of your piece. Uh, you can make simple looms with just four pieces of wood and then hammer some nails or take a sturdy picture frame, take out the glass, and you can warp all the way around it or add some nails. And those are simple ways to make small little tapestry, weave, uh, tapestry looms. And those are easy and portable and a good way to just get started in something. You can weave small pouches or small little favors or little coasters to put under your mug or something like that as a good beginner project or a bookmark. Those are some easy things to start off with. So that's the basics of what I have. Uh, so we're explaining some differences between your rigid heddle, tapestry weaving, inkle weaving, and card weaving and and finger weaving so uh lona if you would like to go ahead and stop the recording please